We are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Kelsey Derringer, and I am the Professional Development Coordinator for Bird Brain Technologies, which means that I get to work with teachers all around the country and all around the world to help them bring creative robotics into their classrooms. But I'm not here by myself. I have a few people here with me today. The first one is Matt. Hey, Matt, how's it going? It's going well, Kelsey. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Matt is not actually a robot. He is our director and producer. <laughs> he's just represented by this friendly cardboard character here. And um, he's going to be monitoring our Facebook live feed, right, Matt? Uh, that's right. So if people have uh, like comments that they want to leave or questions or resources that you'd like to share with the group, go ahead and drop those right in the comments on our Facebook live video. And you can participate in our Zoom call, even if you are watching live on Facebook. But it's also not just me and Matt. I have a number of teachers here as well. Do you guys want to wave hello? Hello. <laughs> we have teachers from spread out all over the country that are with us here today. And I'm really excited to talk with you guys. Our topic for today is we are going to talk about like low floor, high ceiling. And this was an example of what we did yesterday with some students. So we had students log in and we talked about the robot garden. That was our project yesterday. So just to give you a preview of what students did or a review, I suppose, because it already happened. Um, we, I built this little, very tiny little cardboard garden and I'll go ahead and plug the bee back in because they had to program the bee to do a bee waggle dance. Has anybody heard of the bee waggle dance before? And if so, will you tell us when bees dance it back and forth like that, what are they doing? Does anybody want to unmute themselves and let us know? Caroline, you looked like you had heard of the bee waggle <laughs> dance before. What is the bee waggle dance? Will you tell us? <laughs> I have. Um, so there's a National Geographic video that kind of goes along with this activity. And the way that the bee is waggling back and forth between the angles um, tells the other bees the direction and the distance uh, to where they found their pollen. Absolutely. As a, as a person who has now watched that Smithsonian video many, many times, because I've taught this lesson many, many times, you got the wording perfect, too. I can confirm that for you. I've yeah, the too. bees, when they, they go out and they find nectar sources, i.e. flowers, and then they come back to the hive and they communicate. They don't have vocal cords, but they communicate through a, a choreographed dance like this. Just kidding. It's like this. Um, <laughs> and they tell each other where the, where the good flowers are. So we have a lesson plan that goes with this, but we were getting the students to be able to use numbered repeat loops and pause blocks. And here's what their code looked like from there. So here's an example of some code that a student created um, that went with the bee waggle dance portion. So they had inside of a forever loop, they had the position servo going from zero to 20 degrees the short pause and it did that four times and then they had it going from 180 to 160 degrees for the short pause and so this is what that code looks like in action so the the students coded this bee to do a bee waggle dance yesterday but then we expanded their coding knowledge we expanded their their learning about repeat loops and forever loops to also include um, variables so we also took a look at this flower here which is very slowly blooming you can see it from the side there as well. So it's got these straws and string. And in the bottom here, if I turn it all the way to the side, you can see that there is a motor and the motor is gently pulling on the string. And that is what is making the flower bloom very attractively. And so to show you what the code, what the code that the students created, like uh, that looked like. So they were using a variable here. What they did is they were, again, using repeat loops and pause blocks, so we were kind of expanding that pattern there. And they were, uh, they had this position servo, it was set to X as the place that it would start, and we told X to be zero, we set that variable to zero. And then it would change X by two, so it would go X is now, uh, the position servo is now at two degrees, and now at four degrees, and now at six, and now at eight. And if we compare that to where this moves, Right, so our position servo started off at zero degrees and then it went two, four, six, eight, all the way down to 180. And then in the second half of the code here, now it counts by, down by negative two. So now it's at 180 and now it's gonna go 100 and, 
88 or no 178 176 174 170 right so etc down to get all the way back down so they were this pattern here that they were using with the B they expanded on that pattern and then used it with variables and they were able to program this flower to do all sorts of different blooming patterns and if you watch the webinar from yesterday they were getting it to go really fast and it kind of looked like it was gonna like flutter off it was pretty funny <laughs> um, but I definitely recommend that you that you check that out but um, on this idea of like low floor high ceiling um, I kind of want to just hear what you teachers um, feel about this. Has anyone else done a low floor, like a beginning robotics project? What do you think makes a good starter project for a creative robotics question, or, or a creative robotics pro project, really open-ended question? What makes a good starter project? What do you guys think? And you can, if you want to raise your hand, you can kind of wave your hand in front of the camera, or you can just unmute yourself and talk as well. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, so I think the key is really that it's just accessible to students that don't have a lot of background knowledge in um, whatever like robotics or coding platform we're using. Um, so we've had success with um, the like make bit and like um, make code that you're using now. Um, just to, yeah, give, give students an easy way in um, to, what what do you think helps students find an easy way in like what what makes a good entry point um definitely the the drag and drop programming uh, is much less intimidating um, starting with something like scratch um, and like a very visual interface i think works pretty well as well um just taking it yeah taking it down a few notches um, yeah I, I, that has been my experience too and a lot of the teachers that I, I work with as well. And, and that's true not just for elementary or middle school. If you've got students who have never coded before, starting them off on Python is like kind of a lot. <laughs> like I think it's absolutely developmentally appropriate for an 18 year old who has never coded before to start with make code. I've worked with 50 year olds who've never coded before and it is developmentally appropriate for a 50 year old who has never coded before to start with make code or start with scratch right I think it's I think that makes a really good entry point just making sure that the coding language that you're using is friendly to beginners yeah um, and Caroline did you have did you want to add to that uh, I would also add not using too many devices. So the B waggle dance only uses the motors and you're only talking about angles and you're not using the sensors and the lights and all the other things that come with the kit. Yeah, so like limiting it to just a, a couple of components or maybe even one component or one kind of component. Um, yeah. And um, Matt, uh, you had something that you added in the chat. Do you want to unmute yourself and add that? Not my yeah. math, yeah, <laughs> O'Donnell, yeah. <laughs> um, so I love uh, kicking any computational thinking task off with the kinesthetic unplugged activity, getting kids moving so they understand the concept before they even start even block programming. Yeah, I like that too. That's something that I did that I do when I do the when I do the be waggle dance with kids that's something that I do with kids and I did this yesterday like we watched the little video of the be waggle dance and I was like all right show me your be waggle everybody and like a quarter of them did it but I like praised them very I was like yeah get your waggle on yeah like it just got them moving and got them you, moving around you got to decompose that waggle right right you got to <laughs> you got to break it down right break, break it down break it down um, but Tanya had something to add too. Uh, what did you want to add, Tanya? Okay. Um, well, I think students like things that they can relate to, like the that flower project. Um, they know how flowers move. I, I, I have a garden in my classroom, and we actually did this project for an event, and um, we started like with the motors, and then we gradually added different components to expand it. So I think just starting small and then building upon it um, helps students uh, take ownership of it. Yeah, um, I think having a starting project that is easy to build onto is really, really cool. And we'll take a look at ex an example of that with a tiny drummer too. But Matt, it looks like we have a um, Facebook, is that right? 
Yeah, that's right. Um, so Sam uh, was suggesting a project that supports divergent thinking, something where students can offer lots of different solutions and easily tinker without messing up a robot. Ah, that's really, that is really important, I think, for a first project, that it's not like picky, <laughs> that like you can't, that it's hard to break, it's hard to mess up. I think a really good first project, it's like you can look at it and be like, oh yeah, that's how it works, right? Like this B here, like you can just look at this little guy. I'll pop off the top here. Ta-da, it's a motor. I put a motor in a piece of cardboard. I normally don't have the piece of cardboard. I just like have people use a motor and here's the, the servo horn. They hot glue right onto the servo horn and then they get it to move back and forth and they're just holding the motor, right? It is impossible to break this with coding or physically, like it just wiggles back and forth. I think the tiny drummer is really good at that too because it's like, you can't break it. It's very tinkerable as Sam said. I love that word. Like kids can tinker with the code. They can tinker with the physicality of it. I think that makes for a great low floor project as well. Um, and Nick, you had something you wanted to add too. And, and Nick, I'll say, um, if you can unmute yourself, your audio is a little bit um, muddy. So if you can speak really clearly, that would really help us out. Yes. This thing in the, the microphone, the cable. Sure. Um, hopefully that's better. A little bit. Thank you. Yes, it is. Okay, so I, I guess the thing I was going to say was that in terms of the block coding, I use the same thing for um, introduction to Arduino programming, and that has the block coding in Tinkercad, which is very similar to Scratch and what you have there. So it, and the, in Tinkercad is very nice because it has the, the electronics components and models that behave just like, just like real, and you can't break them. It's just like what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, um, oh, yeah. yeah, and the and, and the other thing I was going to say was we did in the last uh, STEM for Kids session we do we have one a free one like every two weeks uh, where kids dial in and do interactive things mm -hmm. and um, there we had one where a guy was explaining his beehives and this bee activity would have been very nice if we'd been able to do that. I mean, I can do the, th the things that you've done. I can I can do everything with what I've got without the bird brain except. I can't connect remotely and let people program it. Right, so, I mean, right. I can show the code. Uh, I can say, how would you modify this? I'm sure what it does, but the sure. kids can't do it themselves. The remote coding is a, a, a really a big boon that, that um, n in all the ways that we're doing remote coding, none of it is, is um, exclusively only a thing that Hummingbird can do. Um, every, all three ways that we do remote coding could apply to a bunch of different um, systems, but we have three, like, we're sort of the center of a bunch of Venn diagrams, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm kind of new to this, so I haven't, I haven't explored any other way, ways of doing it. I mean, and I, I have other, other micro, microcontrollers that have Wi-Fi and other things on them, sure. and it may be possible to integrate them with that, but I don't know, but anyway, yours is a, yeah. like a turnkey system, which makes it uh, easy. That, that, that's what we, that's the goal, thank you. <laughs> um, and on your note of like a Tinkercad or something like that, that models things, I'll point out that in MakeCode, one of the reasons I like using MakeCode so much is that is even if you're just working with, especially if you're just working with a micro bit, it has this simulator over here. So all of the code that we just built has to do with a hummingbird. So this simulator only simulates what the micro bit would be doing and the micro bit itself isn't doing very much. But if you are, um, co if you do have students who are coding uh, just the micro bit, whatever they code it to do, this simulator will show. And I think that's a really cool thing so that if your students don't have micro bits or if they, if they're, if they have a nervousness about this purple download button, sometimes there's some right. like weird insecurities about that. Um, they don't have to download right away. They can see what it's going to do and it can be modeled for them there as well. Yeah, that is good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just to point out where some of these like low floor um, resources, uh, can be found on our website so that you can also do that. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna go through our learning portal really quick. You hit get started, you select your robot, you select your device, you select your programming language, and then you've got all of these resources that are available. And I'm gonna go directly to the resources. These are for classroom teachers. Um, and this first block here is your first hour of robotics. And there's a bunch of different, we actually looked at this one last week. Here's a, another teacher's version of the Bee Waggle Dance for fifth period hive. Pretty cool. 
Um, but there are downloadable lesson plans here. So like this is the B Waggle version, I think. Oh no, this one's the template version. So this one um, has a few different options of what you could do. You could do the B Waggle project, um, which is here. You could do the tiny drummer project, which is here. You could do cutlery characters where you get them to like make a plastic spoon into a character or just saying we were doing cutlery characters before Toy Story 4 came out, but you could totally make a forky. They kind of stole our thing, but it's fine. I'm clearly over it. Um, <laughs> but that's a really fun, fun project and a fun starting place. Um, Matt, what do you got? My uh, Matt. <laughs> well, <laughs> Sam was uh, letting us know that it looks like there's going to be a 2020 version of Make Code Ooh. coming out very soon. And as somebody who makes the learning materials for Bird Brain Technologies, I'm only sort of happy to hear that. <laughs> Yay, there's a new version. We should probably, we're going to have to update all of our stuff, huh? All right. Oh, compatibility. <laughs> yeah, all of our Dreams. screenshots. <laughs> so, um, go ahead, Nick. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I also uh, do go into um, the Maker Fair things as well. So one of the things I ent entertain kids at the Maker Fair, and also I, I under the um, an AAAS, uh, program that's the um, I guess American Association of the Advancement of Science. So okay. they they have a local program in in um, recruiting volunteers to work in middle schools. So I I am part of that also and volunteer in the middle school tech programs. Um, but I I in robots I get the kids, but partly I show them um, programmable robots, but I also show them unprogrammable robots, simple ones. Mm -hmm. And say, how do you think uh, that works? That kind of for example, there's this one, <laughs> right? Which is a very simple soda can robot, which won't fall off the table. Purely mechanical, okay? There's a little motor and doesn't fall off. It reaches the edge and turns around and goes sideways. So, and then this one, which is a beetle bot, with it, with it had sensors, right? Two feelers, which change the direction of the motors using micro switches when it hits something. And this thing zooms around like crazy. And then I have the, the one that, it, that the kids go nuts over, which is my favorite. <laughs> uh, if Sam Yancey's watching, that reminds me of a robot Sam Yancey built recently. So <laughs> that's awesome, Nick. Those are great. Um, so as we're thinking about like uh, having a good starting point, it sounds like the things that we came up with are if, when you're starting kids out on robotics to, to make sure there's a nice low floor for them to step up onto. Um, you want to make sure that you have a friendly programming language, so like a block-based language. Um, you want to make sure that your project is, uh, that whatever you're asking them to build is really simple, that it maybe just uses a couple components, like what Caroline said, and that also it's approachable um, to Tanya's point of like something that looks approachable like a flower and to Sam's point from being online, you want to make sure that it's um, that the, the build of it is tinkerable, that it's not so particular that they could mess it up really easily. You want them to, to find some success with that. Um, so as we're thinking about scaffolding that learning up, actually, before we do that, I, uh, Matt, could you share the joining information for Microbit Classroom again in the chat? Um, because we're going to copy that and put this information in the chat. And um, if you guys would like to, um, if you teachers would like to join um, here on um, Microbit Classroom, here are the folks that we have joined so far. These were all the kids that we had on yesterday, but it looks like uh, Caroline, Chris, Ida, Tanya, Roberta, and Nick are all on here. And I'll just show you briefly um, how, what this feels like and what this looks like. So I'm also signed in as a student here, so I created some student code that is uh, Kelsey flower is what that one is because this is the code for actually it's both the flower and the bee but if I go to the student code section on the top of microbit classroom here I can click on Kelsey flower and actually it looks like the, this is the last code that I shared with everybody so it looks like you guys logged in and you already had this shared with you potentially just in case I'm gonna go ahead and share this flower code with everybody so this is gonna replace whatever you were working on Sorry if this interrupts your flow, but I'm going to send that code to everybody. So if we go to gallery view, give me a thumbs up if you just got a message that says your teacher has just shared some code with you. It's that easy. So I can send you some code that works. And then what we did yesterday is we then encouraged students like to tinker with it. Like, hey, okay, so here's what you might, um, here's what you might mess with in the, um, 
in this uh, variable code here, this is the one that's controlling flower, which is in motor port two, you could change the number, it, it's got a range from zero to 180 degrees. You could change how many degrees it changes by, instead of changing by two degrees, you could make it change by four degrees. But if you do that, you've also got to change the number of times it repeats, because now it needs to repeat fewer times for it to, to do its thing, right? So we were encouraging them to play with that, also to play with the amount of wait time. And we had a student do something so perfect yesterday. I, I asked, I was like, all right, we're gonna use yours, you know, Lucas, whatever it was, Logan, I think was his name. We're gonna use your code, Logan. What did you change? Talk me through it. And so they were talking about what they changed. He goes, I just took the pause blocks out. I just wanted to see what would happen. What a perfect thing for a kid to say when they're doing something new, right? I just wanted to see what happened. Okay, let's try it. And we downloaded it. What are you guys' predictions as for what happened when we took the pause blocks out? Does anybody want to unmute and venture a guess? What happened? Probably just kept going and going. Yeah. The, uh, I'm finding, I'm, I'm going to see if I can find that video just to show you what it looked like when we took the pause blocks completely out um, and see his reaction to it. Um, but it's like somewhere... I'm gonna mute it. It's like somewhere in here, we're using Lucas's or Logan's code. Okay, this is another kid's code. There, that's what happens. That's what happens when you take the pause block out. <laughs> it just moves real, real fast like that, right? And it was, it was a hoot because like, Logan thought that was hilarious. And he was like, yeah, I see why the pause blocks are muted now. I was like, do you like how that, do you like how that's moving, Logan? And he was like, I guess. I mean, it's kind of, it, it looks kind of dumb. And I was like, yeah, we should probably put those pause blocks back in. But it was just like, it was great watching students just change some numbers. And sometimes we'd ask them, what do you think is going to happen? And they would say, I don't know, let's just download it and see. And that is so perfect. Um, so uh, something that we're really interested in here is less of the like step by step, do this, do this, do this, but like um, more the sort of like inquiry based model of how can we encourage students to do computer science in an inquiry based way. And I want to open that up to you guys. What are, what are your top tips or what are ideas that you have about encouraging students to learn computer science in an inquiry based way? What do you think about that? Um, and Ida, you're muted, but I'd love to hear what you're, yeah. I'm going to say that uh, I show them very interesting projects. For example, uh, my uh, little angels, uh, the very young ones, I showed them the um, uh, car that was um, the Bugatti car, uh, Chiron, that was made out of Lego parts. And it actually uh, went about 45 miles an hour. So, uh, so I showed them that, and then uh, I asked them a lot of questions about uh, what kinds of uh, things would you need to know to be able to do that? What subjects would you need to know? Uh, if the Bugatti is selling for $3 million, how wow. much do you think that the software engineer is earning? Um, and just, you know, really getting their attention, um, you know, by showing them those things and then having a, a q and A. I'm really big on problem solving mm -hmm. and getting them to um, think critically and, and just, just giving them all kinds of examples like that and then talking about them. And I think that that, that um, helps and gets their attention. And I tell them, oh, and I tell them about the salaries that, that software engineers make and roboticists and, and uh, you know, just get them real excited about the whole area. So your method of, start, of, of inquiry based is like starting with something really cool and then let's brainstorm what we would need to get from where we are to where that is. That's a, that's a great way to, to um, do some inquiry-based learning. Um, what else? How, what else are some ways that, um, you are, that you teach or that you think we could teach computer science in an inquiry-based way? Yeah, Chris. Yeah, I think sometimes it's easy to fall into the trap of like buying something, um, a certain kit or something, and then following the steps to do like the first project, build this, and then the second project, build that. Um, and I think the the key is really instead of starting with a a project and like step by step directions for 
how to do this, um, rather proposing a problem. So like um, mm -hmm. the bee needs to pollinate the flower. How can we make that happen? And so like letting the students kind of think through and brainstorm their own project or their own approach to solve that problem um, rather than saying like step one connect the servo to the bee like especially with older kids having them figure out like what pieces would we need to use um, that we have available to make the bee move um, yeah so that it can pollinate the flower just presenting them with the problem rather than presenting them with the solution exactly um, that I, I think that's that's inquiry-based learning right? Like, here's a problem. I'm not going to show you how it works. So I think sometimes teachers, uh, uh, a, a lot of the way that we are taught to learn is like, here's an example, try to recreate this. And what I do when I when I'm teaching the bee waggle, I don't, I don't show them one, like maybe some I, sometimes I'll show them a um, sometimes I'll show them like a, a styrofoam one. But especially if it's an open ended project like robot poetry, or robot like um, petting zoo, I don't want theirs to look like mine. I want to see what they come up with and I want to trust that they are problem solvers. And if they're not great problem solvers, well, that's why we're doing it. Right. I want to trust that they are going to find that they are going to, I will present them with a challenge. Right. But I'm going to trust that they will even hopefully be able to identify the sub problems that will get them to be able to create an answer to that challenge. So when we're thinking about scaffolding up from a beginning project to a more advanced project, I think just presenting them with an open-ended problem is great. Looks like we have a comment coming in um, from Facebook. Is that right, Matt? Yeah. Uh, Daryl from Facebook was suggesting that uh, you use the uh, design thinking process to engage, uh, to engage kids in inquiry-based learning. Absolutely. That's something that we, are, uh, that we use a lot, too. I think I have that over here. Nope. Different thing. Um, <laughs> Somewhere I have an engineering design process poster, but there's absolutely one on our website. Um, so let me show you where to find that. I'll go back to, oops, I'll go back to um, our resources page here. So if I go to resources, there's an awesome um, set of assessment tools here that include the design thinking or engineering design process. So if I go to assessment guides, there's two different ones. There is the computational thinking assessment guide and the engineering design assessment guide. So I'll start with that one since um, our friend on Facebook suggested design. So this right here is the engineering design process, right? Of ask, imagine, or I guess ask, understand, plan, create, improve. That's the, that's the steps that we want students to be able to go through. So the way that that fits into this assessment guide, this assessment guide is not a rubric or a checklist or a grading scale or anything like that. It's more um, to help teachers understand what these concepts are. So like engineering design has been broken into, I think, four skills. The first one is defining the problem, exactly what you were just talking about, Chris. We want students to be able to do that for themselves as well. The second one is like intentional design, which is broken into a couple parts. And then there's innovating, broken into a few parts. And refining and testing, which is uh, broken into a few parts. Oh, and then a fifth one, prototyping. And the sixth one, communication design. I'm very familiar with the CT one, and that only has three parts, sorry. <laughs> um, but then the last one is we take all those skills and we give it just like a, we put it in the form of a question and then give you as a teacher a place to write, like write down observations. So I think this is really, really helpful if a teacher like familiarizes themselves with this a little bit, puts this on a clipboard, and as they're walking around, as students are, are, engaging in a design process, in an engineering design process. Um, Matt's gonna drop that link in the chat, I bet, yep. Um, and as, as um, they're doing that, you're walking around and going, okay, uh, deliberate the plan, deliberate planning, following a plan, generating multiple solutions. Hey, I just heard this group think about three different ways that they could attach some um, material inside that flower. So I'm gonna write um, the, the flower group just generated multiple solutions or you're walking around and um, trade-off considerations. You hear uh, a group saying, we're gonna do this and this and this and this, and we're gonna do all of it in this one project and it's gonna be so great. They might need some help considering trade-offs. <laughs> so maybe you sit down with them and you go, well, maybe, you know, thinking about our time, we don't have six weeks, we have the next two hours to finish this project. So let's think about some trade-offs here. 
what, how is this going to serve the goal? How is that going to serve the goal? How difficult is this? Do we have the materials to finish that so that you're guiding them through that process and you can make a little note and then you might be surprised the next time you go around, you might hear them starting to do that in their, in their next project. So I think that this assess, these assessment tools for both engineering design and computational thinking are really useful projects or very useful tools for educators to use when they're trying to foster those habits of mind and those thinking skills um, over the course of a, a few different projects over a year. Um, so definitely check those out if you haven't yet. Um, so uh, to continue our conversation, we were talking about how to, how to start, what makes a good low floor project, how to teach in an inquiry based way, um, and now thinking about how, how to like raise the ceiling. Um, we talk about like low floor, high ceiling, um, that's a, something uh, that Mitch Resnick, um, who, who is instrumental in the Scratch project, um, always talks about low floor, high ceiling, and wide walls too, to just like expand that to a third dimension. A good, like good teaching is easy to start, hard to master, this is for game design too, easy to start, hard to master, and can go in a lot of different ways, a lot of different directions. And so I'm, I'm really, um, I'm always happy to see the different directions teachers take Hummingbird in too. Um, but thinking about raising, raising the ceiling and raising the ceiling of what your students could do, um, we took the same, we took this concept of like repeat loops and we took that concept and introduced variables. So it's really easy to um, scaffold up the learning and the, the computer science that your students are doing um, with a Hummingbird. You can scaffold them up. And that's actually something personally I'd like to see more of in the hummingbird teacher community that that they're not just making one hummingbird project that involves like a couple lights and a couple motors and like hey we did a hummingbird project but like there's such a high ceiling here you can get so weird if you give your students a chance to do more advanced computer science you don't have to level off at just lights and motors and sensors you can really do some advanced things and there are teachers out there doing wonderful things but I want to encourage teachers to continue that um, but there's also opportunities to level up like the building that your students are doing. A great example of this is um, Jane Sweet. She's an art teacher who works just outside of Pittsburgh. And she um, originated the Moving Masterpieces Project. And would you pull that up on our project page, Matt, in the background? Thanks. Um, so uh, um, Jane started out with this Moving Masterpieces Project where she had students pick a famous work of art and bring it to life with lights and motors. And she'd been doing that project with her students for a couple years, presenting on it at like national and worldwide conferences. She's really well known for this project. Um, and then when we created these mechanism videos, which I'm also gonna show you in a second, she added another criteria to her students' projects, which was, and you have to do all those things, and you have to have a mechanism in your project. Your thing has to include a mechanism. And so she leveled up the building that her students were doing, um, like, putting in a cable mechanism. So we have a video, uh, that, a, a set of video tutorials that'll teach you how to make cable mechanisms. So like with some still pretty simple programming and your programming can be super simple with a mechanism, uh, you can level up the building of your program, uh, of your um, robotics project as well. So if I, thanks for pulling that up, Matt. Here's our moving masterpieces project. And I'm just gonna mute this and put it in the background so you can see some of those art projects that, um, Allegheny middle, middle School students did with Jane Sweet. There's Starry Night. Um, and you can see they put like the original work of art next to it as well, American Gothic. <laughs> These are all just such great projects. And they also had to justify, okay, here's how it moved and here's why we decided to make it move like that. Why did that character move, not the other one? Why did its head move? Why did its butt move? <laughs> they had to um, write and they worked in groups. They also had to write why that worked. That one's so amazing. It's one of my all time favorites. It's so great. Um, why'd you pick this piece of art? Why did it move like that? Um, such a great project. That's also on our, if I am on this page here, or if I'm on, excuse me, if I'm here, we looked at some resources. All those projects, including moving masterpieces, are on this teach page here. Um, so let me throw that to you, uh, to you educators here on Zoom. When you're thinking about leveling up a project, Tanya had a great idea of like uh, the robot garden being, I think one of them is like, this started as just a bee, but then we expanded, like staying within the project, we expanded it to include 
more coding and more building in this second version of the project uh, of the uh, the second project within the same like overall arching project but how about you guys what are your favorite resources or your favorite tips for how to raise the ceiling in terms of building or coding when you're working with creative robotics how do you guys encourage students to um, not just do the same program they did before, not just build the same thing they did before? Uh, or does it, does it require your encouragement to get them to, to try new things? <laughs> yeah, Roberta. Hi, yeah, so I love to use the human-centered design process too. I'm so glad someone brought it up. I think that really helps um, students take more ownership. And I, I find that that's when they really go above and beyond when you give them like uh, um, options, voice and choice, and then they decide. And then they, they kind of like learn things on their own and they always surprise me with new things that they add to their projects. Yeah, the more we can kind of like step away from step-by-step -step projects and just give them open-ended questions, like it's gotta have this, this, and this, but other than that, it's up to you. You know, um, just giving them voice and choice I, I love everything you were just saying, Roberta. They scaffold themselves up because they don't want to do the same project again. They already did that. They want to, maybe it's more artistic this time, or maybe it moves differently this time, or maybe it does something different in coding. I think the, that, that kids tend to ask more and more interesting questions about coding the more they do it. They see that like, I can get the light to blink. Can I get it to blink faster when I get closer? I don't know. But the answer is usually, yeah with math, like we can solve that problem with some math and some logic and like what, what a great reason to need math and logic is that a kid asks, can my robot do this? Yeah, with math, a, a much more authentic way to bring that into the conversation, I think. Um, yeah, Matt, looks like we have a, a comment coming in. Uh, yeah, we actually have a couple comments coming oh. in. Uh, Daryl was saying that uh, leveling up can involve using uh, sensors for interactivity. And then Sam was saying that you could start with what students want to build, then investigate what mechanisms could fit in those designs. So similar to what Jane Sweet was doing. Yeah. So um, uh, Daryl, uh, both a both a building and a coding leveling up from just using outputs like lights and motors, adding a sensor to it. And I think that 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 can really go with what Roberta was saying too. Human centered design. One of my favorite ways that people do the robot petting zoo project is um, how here's an animal, whether it's a puppy or a scorpion, how would someone interact with this? And what would it do when they actually interact with it? Is this a scorpion? Does the scorpion wag its tail when you pet it? Wag seems like the wrong verb there, <laughs> right? But like, does the puppy bite you? I don't know, it's your puppy, right? So like adding a sensor in in a human-centered design way of like, how would someone interact with this animal and what would it do when you, when you do that? I think that's a, that's a great way to bring sensors into a project. Um, and then what, uh, what Sam was saying and what I know he's working on this summer is he's working on familiarizing himself with all of the mechanism builds that we have on our website so that when students have a project and they go, all right, I want the wings to flap like this and I want the tongue to come out like this. He's like, yes. And you can do that with a mechanism. So um, I'm just gonna go back briefly um, to show people where to find this. So we looked at stuff on the resources page, on the teach page. Hey, we have a whole page full of building resources. If I click on that, the very top thing on there, these are a bunch of mechanisms. So for example, the cable system, this is a 13 step, like all these videos are really, really short. They're like maybe 30 seconds. Um, and we go through and we tell you like step two is like here's the materials you're gonna need We go through and we show you all right. You're gonna need to connect a string to a, um, a Servo horn, which is exactly what we did In here, right? You can see the string is connected onto that servo horn there. There we go That's how I should turn that so there's the string on the servo horn there and um, We've got uh, Here we go um, it's like pulling up and down. And so this is the same basic cable mechanism. It's just um, powering four strings instead of one, which is what it's doing in uh, this tutorial here, right? Um, this is just powering one. But all of these different mechanisms, 
Um, they all involve like maybe eight, like one motor, I think, but you could also make them more complicated. But what Sam is saying is uh, kind of both in response to like inquiry based and leveling up and, and finding a higher ceiling on what your um, students are able to do. What do you want to build, kid? This mechanism could help. And like you as a teacher, um, but uh, you can point them towards their resources here. You don't need to know everything about how to do this. You can say, hey, that piston mechanism could be great for you. Why don't you watch that tutorial and take yourself through it? Um, and uh, let's see, was it Nick? Nick had a really interesting question. Do you wanna uh, read your question out that you typed in the chat, Nick? I think it could be a great way to, to a great thing to end on. Uh, sure. So you were talking about trying to encourage the kids to innovate and to uh, <clears throat> get my microphone back, uh, okay. try to encourage the kids to innovate and try different ways of doing things. But how do you give credit to failure in that they may try things that are um, like overreaching a bit or things that don't work, but they're still learning from that. So if, if the object is to make them learn, they can learn by failing just as well as succeeding, even if they don't uh, get there. So, so what do you do with that? How do you um, credit them with doing something more difficult but uh, they don't end up yeah. with this nice working project at the end of the activity. I mean, they have That's to be rewarded for, do, for doing it and not feel bad about a failure. But um, it, I guess I'm, I'm not being a professional teacher in a school setting. Generally, I think kids are not given uh, credit for failure. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the school system is set up so that like you fail a test, hey, you failed the test. You don't get to like redo it. Sometimes you do, but that's like, mm. whoa, that's really progressive. Retake the test crazy um but like uh students aren't necessarily set up to learn well from failure um but let me put that to you teachers um how do you how do you help your students and we've probably only got time for maybe one answer for this but like how do you help your students learn from failure because they have to does anyone want to give that one just just your personal teacher philosophy on how do you help students learn from failure? Yeah, Roberta. Yeah, I, I love failure in design failures and opportunities. So I even have a little book and sometimes we had leaks in the lab, we made umbrellas. So I actually oh. give students an epic fail award and they kind of like fight for that. And I learned that from the Entertainment Technology Center in, in Carnegie Mellon. And they, they win an award when they really push themselves for trying something super, super hard, even if the project doesn't work. Yeah, I can say I'll, something more with that. In the uh, local school, they're doing some online teaching, and one of the latest sessions, because they're finished now, was to um, the teacher showed them um, some movies of epic failures. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, one of the famous ones is the the bridge swaying in the wind, uh, and then yeah. a couple of other ones. And had had the kids discuss why they think that failed, what else might they do, and yeah. this this got into it interestingly. And what else I think is really smart about um, Re, uh, uh, Roberta's um, method there is like, it's not rewarding all little failures. Like we don't want to encourage our students to like, you know, if it's just like every time you fail, you get a piece of candy. I'll fail for candy, <laughs> you know, but like rewarding epic failures in, in the sense that like you tried so hard, you went so hard for this and it so didn't work and I'm so proud of you. Like I think rewarding that kind of failure, you know it when you see it, right? Um, and, and everybody else does too. So like using your judgment as a teacher um, to foster the kind of classroom experience and the kind of classroom climate that you want, I think that's a really good way to do it. Not, not all failures are equal and the ambitious ones are the ones that we really wanna, wanna reward. Um, we have just a couple minutes left before we'll need to end our session. Um, looks like we had one other comment come in from Facebook and then uh, we'll, we'll take that comment and then we'll probably end our stream there. But you teachers who are here on Zoom, feel free to hang out for a couple extra minutes if you'd like. But Matt, what is our comment from Facebook? Uh, well, Denise from Facebook says, fail equals the first attempt in learning. And I think that's a great <laughs> note to end on. Yeah, uh, and uh, Roberta said that uh, their motto in her classroom is process over pretty. And, um, and Ida also said that she doesn't call them failures, she calls them design improvements. That's Orwellian and I dig it. 
Um, <laughs> um, so I want to encourage everybody to, whether you are teaching with Hummingbird or have questions about Hummingbird, whether you're doing remote robotics and teaching remotely or excited to get back in your classroom in the fall, please do connect with us on social media. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and uh, tag us in any posts that you, ha that you make that are relevant to what we're up to because we will retweet you and we will repost you and hopefully connect you to lots of great educators out there solving the same problems that you are working on. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to email us, info at birdbraintechnologies.com. Um, those can be questions about um, ordering, hey, I'm doing a summer program and I want 30 kids to join. Can you get me some special pricing? Anything like that, reach out to us via email. And also, if you are looking for ways to run your summer camp online, you had a great plan for how you were going to do this and now it's Corona canceled. You should check us out on this part of our website, birdbraintechnologies.com slash robotics at home. There you're going to find all of our upcoming live webinars for students and for teachers. We do one student one and one teacher one every week. And up till now, they've been on Thursdays and Fridays, but we're switching that up over the next couple weeks. So if you haven't been able to make it live in the past, check out our upcoming dates and times um, because you may be able to make it. And if you've been coming consistently, check our dates and times because you should check our dates and times, they're changing. <laughs> the times they are changing means a different thing, but applies here. Um, and uh, you can also find ordering information on there. You can find courses so that you or your students can teach yourselves Hummingbird with tablets or um, computers. Also some great project outlines. Um, and finally, you can find instructions on how to do robotics at home, how to set up something called Nets Blocks, um, and also, um, I think we are going to soon link to, we have a webinar on YouTube that goes over three different ways to do ro ro remote robotics with Ma Microsoft MakeCode, Zoom Remote Coding, and um, NetsBlocks. That's going to be linked on there uh, soon as well. So check that out if you're interested in learning how to do robotics at home. So from all of us at BirdBrain, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you teachers who are here on Zoom, and we will see you next week. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to see what you make on social media. On Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, you can tag at birdbraintech or hashtag hummingbirdkit, or you can even tag me. If you have any questions, be sure to email us, info at birdbraintechnologies.com. We can answer questions about purchasing, about learning, about teaching, and about professional development. If you haven't been there yet, be sure to visit our Robotics at Home page. There, you can purchase a kit for yourself, learn how to use it, and even join one of our upcoming webinars. Until we see you in class, thanks for watching from everyone at BirdBrain Technologies.